Welcome back to Data Vids. Today we're going to run through CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. So you do need to know a little bit of HTML before we begin, but if you don't, shouldn't be too big of a deal. I'm going to keep it pretty simple with the HTML stuff that's involved. You do not need to know JavaScript, but it might help. All right, well, let's jump right into it. Bye. CSS is just to style what you see on the screen. So HTML is already broken down into tags. For instance, paragraphs, the body, you might have lists, you might have tables, but the browser gets to decide how to display those things. If you don't give the browser any hints about how to make them look, it's just going to use its default look for those elements and every web page is going to look the same, which takes away your creative ability and makes everything really generic. And that's what CSS kind of fixes for us. So we have to decide where we're going to put our CSS in our HTML document. I have here the most basic HTML page you'll ever see. Um, it's just literally three paragraphs, right? So where you can put your CSS. So inline CSS, though it might be used the least frequently, is going to be right on your elements. So we'll get more into detail. So if you're confused about anything I do here, just hold that thought. It's the only way I can really show you inline. So if I use the style HTML keyword, and then I select a CSS element, for instance, font, and give it the value medium, this right here is an inline style, which is an inline CSS. This gets loaded first and takes priority. Second, the second way of doing it, and the second priority, you could say, would be in the head tag of your HTML document, you could create a style tag, the style HTML tag. And within that style HTML tag, you just write CSS. So for instance, if we had a paragraph here, we could say everything in that paragraph is going to have the font weight of bold. And this would take secondary priority after inline CSS. This is internal CSS. Now, external CSS. External CSS is what this is here. We have a link tag with an href with the direct uh, how to get to that CSS file. Now, depending on the type of project that you're in, you may have some relative marks like that, or you may have relative like that, or you may have just, just the CSS just like this which is in most cases that I've seen, you have to tell it that a relationship style sheet. Now, um, another thing is these external style sheets, which is in its own file, could actually be not on your web server. It could be out there on Google or something like that. In fact, what's been kind of a, a new thing that I've noticed is that for increased speeds, there's something called a content delivery network or a CDN, uh, for instance, with Bootstrap. And I think I put one of those down here in sample three, um, where you could see uh, for if you're using Bootstrap style sheet, it's going to go out there to a CDN so that it's going to be faster load times for the users. And they're strategically placed, these CDNs, so that it's the fastest way to get those resources out to you. And it's used for more than just style sheets. It could be used for other things like images. So that's kind of outside the scope of this, but your CSS, if you're, uh, if you're like a sysadmin, look into that because you can pay for a CDN that could get uh, some of these websites sped up for you. Uh, and CSS would just be one of the files amongst larger files that are out there. The last thing to hit on, on these style sheets as far as where you're getting the CSS from or where you're building your CSS is that if you've got inline CSS, lots of it, and you've got um, internal CSS up there in the head tag with a CSS, uh, with a style tag, and then you've got your style sheet and you want something to be higher priority, that is you want to change the priority than the default priority, and you'd like your, say, your external style sheet to override something somewhere else, use the important tag. That changes it. So since external style sheet is the 
last in the order of priority, you can make it become the first by using important. Notice that the semicolon is at the end. It's not after the value, it's after the word important. So exclamation mark important. And you would have to do that on each one of these, I believe, within that tag. So let's jump over to a file that I have put together called um, data vid style one. Okay. So this is often what you see here is just the type of elements here. So if you have divs in your page, you could say div, and then you use these squiggly uh, brackets here, and then you could put your CS tags inside of that. Uh, break these out um, by putting them one after the next after the next. Uh, for instance, you could do an unordered list. Um, you could say list items within those lists. Uh, and I promise you, I'm not just going to be throwing out HTML terms this whole thing. Uh, <laughs> but those are from HTML, right? So anyways, uh, if you would like to not have to say um, each one of these types of elements are background color blue, you could combine them all by separating them with a comma. I believe that's called the group operator. So now what's happening is I'm saying that any paragraph, any div, or any of these other two tag types that we have in our HTML document all get this color. I don't care if you have 50 paragraphs, they all go aqua. If you have 10 divs, they all go aqua. You get the picture. So now I don't need this. I can delete that. And this does the same thing. Another thing that you could do to um, apply something to lots of different elements is using the class. But first, I'd like to show you what this looks like. So I'm going to take off everything except for the paragraph because we have a really simple HTML page here. And I'm going to run it, and you're going to see it go aqua. So in Visual Studio Code, I can just do run and tell it you know, what I'm running it in. And it's just HTML and CSS, so I could just choose Chrome. As you can see, my text went aqua, and I have the three paragraphs there. If I was to go back to my CSS and choose blue, oh, blue violet, did you know that was a thing? I could run back here and refresh it, and now the color's changed. We'll cover some more of these properties, but first we're going to cover some more of the selectors, okay? So we talked earlier about the grouping. Let's talk now about classes and then we'll do IDs. So if you go back to your HTML and you specify a class, for instance, why don't we do on our second paragraph, we'll give it the class of uh, data vids rocks. Okay. And let's give that same class to the third paragraph. But let's not give that class to the first paragraph. I'm going to copy data viz rocks into my clipboard and I'm going to go back to my CSS file. Now I'm going to use the period and data viz rocks and then my curly braces. So what I just did is I said the class of data viz rocks should get these properties. So why don't we do now um, font dash size extra large and let's do background color dark gray save that we'll go back to our file and we'll run it so the second two got those two properties okay now let's do an id select so if I go here and I say my first paragraph has the ID of data vids by itself. Now keep in mind, ID is supposed to be unique. Developers know regardless of whether they're front end uh, or uh, regardless of what front end technology their background is in, developers know that ID is unique. Okay, if it's not unique, then you might have something wrong with the design and style of your website, whether it's dynamic 
or whether it's just static HTML. So think about that. Kind of like one form element. So why don't we say hashtag data bids. Hashtag means this ID. This ID should get these properties. So we could say font size small or smaller and background color dark red. And I'll save that and then we'll run the HTML file. And there you go. So it grabbed this one by ID and it grabbed these two by class. Two more selectors that I can show you really quickly that are kind of roll right into this topic would be I can combine what I showed you earlier with the grouping with these classes and with the ID. So I could have two classes here. I could have two classes, one ID. So I just put a comma and I could put data vids here. And now I could say everything with this class or this ID gets these values. You could even throw in there or anything with the div that's in a div. The next really easy one to pick up would be the universal selector. And that just means everything. Every HTML element on the page gets whatever attributes are within here. Gets whatever, pro I'm sorry, properties are within here. So another really interesting one is the greater than symbol. So check this out. If I was to um, say that div greater than data fits rocks, but that could, I mean, it could be a paragraph, could be anything on the right. I'm just saying it's greater than this class means that, and I'll put these things in here, but I'm saying that with this selector, anything that's on the right side of the selector that has the parent of what's on the left side of the selector will be selected and everything else will not be selected. So I'm saying any element that has the class data bits rocks, but is nested within a div will have these properties applied to it. So let's see what that looks like. I'm going to go over here to um, our HTML and just kind of wrap one of them in a div to make it actually work. So why don't we use the middle element? So this has the class, this paragraph has the class data of its rocks and is within this div. This class has the par this class or this paragraph has data of its rocks, but is not nested within a div. I'll save that and we're going to run it now. As you can see, only the one that was wrapped in the div is lit up. Now, if I had two of them with the parent of a div, then two of them would be lit up. Okay, guys, that's all I'm going to cover for selectors. I want to jump into some other interesting stuff because I don't think that showing you all the selectors right now is really going to benefit you at this stage. Selectors is something that you want to go reference from a web page. So look at the link at the top of the screen there and bookmark that and come right back to this video because I think that you can now imagine that any selector is possible. In your CSS file, if you want to add a comment, you can put it at any place in your CSS. Just use the, the star slash method. It won't affect your code, okay? Boom! I just typed a whole bunch of stuff really fast. Did you see it? Ha, ah, no. I pasted it in there. Okay, so check this out. This is the different ways you can represent color. Now, I know I said earlier background dash color. But the only difference is with background, I can throw in a whole bunch of extra stuff here. I'll talk about that in a second. So background or background color, in this case, won't make a difference. So one way you can do it is just using color words. Another way is to see is to say your RGB. And you know, depending on whether you are coming from you know a graphics background or depending on just how you've designed your page. For instance, if you're using the color picker tool, uh, it's probably going to give it to you in hex. Uh, there are some other tools out there that is going to give you the hue, saturation, and lightness. Um, but you know, most likely, 
uh, from what I've seen, most developers typically stick with the hex or the color names, but who knows, you may only use RGB. They all work just fine. Um, so as you can see, I've applied them to a color class, A, B, and C. If you go to my sample HTML1, I've applied them. And here you can see what it would look like, although I might have picked better choice for this last one. As you can see, it almost looks like black and white, but it's not, or sort of a maroonish color, right? <laughs> So as I mentioned earlier, this background tag, instead of doing background dash color, is kind of nifty because you can combine things. So for instance here, I could say, I want the background to be a URL or an image of a tree. I don't want the background to repeat across the screen and I want it located to come down from the, the top right. So that's what that was about. Another super useful um, property is opacity. So let's say you have your divs and you have, uh, say, images throughout your website, um, but you also want to have some background uh, color or another image. And you want to have an image on top of an image. And you want to say, I want to see 10% kind of of the image behind it. And I want to see 100% of the image on top of it kind of superimpose things, you can use opacity and just give it a percentage. So say 30% is 0.3. So then if you have another class within that, you know, you could say that one's going to be hundred percent by default, it's just going to be opacity one. So you don't have to specify it. Let's real quickly talk about borders and the dot operator. So if I want to say dot my class Oh, B, then we're just saying any div that has um, this class will be selected. So there's another selector for you. And as far as borders go, there's a whole bunch of border tags. Oh, so you could just pick um, just the first one, border, to give it a color. So let's say we want to give it a gold border. And then the border dash width. You say how wide it is. You've got all different types of units that you'll have to get used to in CSS. Um, I often stick with the point, um, but uh, depending on your organization, you probably come up with a standard of what you'd like to use. Uh, sometimes it's something else. Um, there's a couple other interesting ones. You could do dotted. Uh, you could do spacing. Uh, style. Let's do solid. Okay. And now let's give that a shot. So we said div my class B. So let's come in here and let's do a div. It's class my class B. Make sure we Got it right. And let's take this class off here so we don't, so it's easier to recognize. Oops, take this off of here. Take this off of here. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. So you got your gold border around it. So what do you see here? I think one thing I spot right away that might lead to our next CSS uh, property to learn is that the text is rammed right up against the border. Maybe we need a little bit of spacing in there. So let's go back to our CSS file. And within that div with that class, Let's add a margin. Let's do a margin left. And let's do five pixels. I said points earlier. I meant to say pixels, but either way. So you can do margin left, or you could just do margin and just do like this. Oops. Five pixel, five pixel, five pixel, five pixel. 
And what that's going to do is it's going to get the left, the right, the top, and the bottom all at once instead of having to do dash left, dash right, dash top, dash bottom. Now before we run this thing, the margin gave it some space on the outside of that border. Let's give it some space on the inside of that border. The opposite of that margin is the padding. And it works the same way. I could specify the left, right, bottom, or I could just give it the generic one and specify all four at the same time. So now if I run it, it should be a little bit more interesting. I went ahead and added the class B. So as you can see, it added some space between the L and the line, it added some space between the line and the side of the page, it added some space at the bottom and the top. So we've covered divs. Now we're going to cover spans. So a span is something that you could put. Let's close this thing here. So a span is something that you could put in the middle of a sentence. <clears throat> so with a div, if you noticed earlier, we we're wrapping entire paragraphs. We're wrapping images in divs. We're wrapping things that would necessarily break the line. And that's because they were a block element. We'll get to that in just a second. Now, a span is something you could put in the middle of a sentence if you just wanted to affect just a couple of words, or you could put it to affect a couple of an image or two without going down to the next line. That's because a span allows you to do things that are in line. So I've taken the original document that we had. Oops. So I've taken the original document that we had and I have removed the divs for this example and just put the paragraphs back and place spans instead for data vids one, two, and three classes. Uh, and the spans are using those classes. And in the CSS file, I went ahead and created those classes on spans. So data vids one, two, and three, and they're all the same. The only difference is this new property, this new CSS property that I wanted to show you, well, new to you, I think, we'll see is called display and we have inline inline block and block and this is a really simple but really important concept so inline means that you can make changes without forcing the formatting to push things to the next line however inline just means one line no other formatting don't respect the width and height inline block means Respect the, the width and height, but it also means that anything under it must be pushed down, but it doesn't push the current element down. And that'll make sense when we run it. You'll understand the difference between inline and inline block. But just an easy way to remember it is the inline block respects the width and height, but that does affect other elements that are placed after what's in this span. Now, block is kind of like a div. All divs are automatically block whereas spans by default are inline and if you want to use inline block you're going to have to specify it and you can force other elements to be inline or block just by saying display block dis or display inline so now that you've seen what's going on remember that what we've applied is uh, data vids one is going to be inline data vids two inline block data vids three block and I've placed them in that same order. So when we run it, we'll see inline, inline block, and then block. All right, so now as you could see, the inline we've formatted, it doesn't respect the width and height that I specified because this is obviously not 100. That looks like, what, 10, 20 pixels there? This is 100 pixels here, the second one down. And what we're seeing here is that inline block respected the height, but didn't affect this. It allowed it to keep going, but then the next the next item, the next paragraph, the next HTML element is now below that 100. And then block specifically just puts everything that's within that block, and then it kind of creates a page break right after it, you could call it, where it goes to the next line, because that is block. Okay, so that's the difference between those three. All right, I wanted to cover now alignment, text alignment, that is. And then we'll talk about images, then we'll talk about image alignment. So here we go. So straight up text align center, text align left and right. This may seem kind of 
like you could guess this, right? But the reason why it's important to cover in any beginner CSS tutorial or video is just because a lot of people may have worked with HTML and then they didn't touch it for a long time and now they're back to learning development again. And back in the day, I believe, I remember, we used to have a center uh, as a as a attribute. So, or I think we even had center as a HTML tag. So uh, I might be remembering that wrong, but I know we used to do center with just HTML and now we do uh, actually text align center with um, CSS. So anyways, I did the top one center left and right and just how we did um, the span earlier, I'm doing div. Div with the class of data bits 1, any div with the class of data bits 2, and any div with the class of data bits 3. And over here in the HTML, likewise, I've got a div with the class data bits 1, data bits 2, etc. So let's go ahead and run that. And I did make them separate colors, so it's obvious to see the separation. As you can see, the top paragraph in red is centered. And then we've got one that's left aligned, and then we've got one that's right aligned. All right, let's jump into images, and then we'll talk about how to align those. All right, <clears throat> so before we apply any CSS to it, I want to put an image on the screen. Um, we can also apply images as a background image using just CSS. But let's add a regular image first. So in our first div here, I'm going to add image source equal to, oops, logo.png. It's in the same folder, self closing tag. So if I go ahead and refresh, um, or I could just stop and run that. And it's a massive picture. So what if we wanted to make it smaller using CSS? Well, that we can do. First thing I want to do is, in my case, why don't we just apply it to all images? Although, if you remember, you could always apply it to an ID. If I had an ID equal, or I could apply it to a class, or all image tags, or any image within a div. There's so many choices, right? I'm going to apply it to all images. I'm going to go over my CSS, go to the top or the bottom, do image, and let's just say we want them all to have a height of 150 pixels and a width of 150 pixels. You also can do percents here. We can do 50%. If I do 50%, it should scale it. So why don't we do that? We haven't shown that yet. Since I'm applying it just to the width, it should keep aspect ratio. Saving both, run, start debugging, Chrome. And it kept aspect ratio and it's 50%, 50% width. All right, let's see what that would look like if we wanted to move it left or right, just like we did with the text alliances. I did promise I'd show you that. Well, the tool for that is in CSS is we're gonna say, do you wanna float it? Float left or float right? of other objects that are next to it. So if you wanted to put it to the right of something else, you'd float it to the right. So let's give that a shot. So I can come over here and I could say float right. And we'll run this. As you can see, it's floated to the right of other objects. Put everything else to the left. And if I do left, it's going to be a similar result just on the other side. And I'm pretty sure you can guess what that's going to look like. There you go. So the next thing I want to cover is clear. So clear can be a confusing topic for some beginners at CSS, but it doesn't have to be if you get explained the correct way from the start. So let's do that. So you just learn float, which means we're floating elements to the right, we're floating elements to the left, to get them out of the way of the other things on the screen. But if you want then to clear the area to the side of it, to where you just floated, and bring everything down below it, you use the clear context. As to which clear you use, well, in this picture, we're floating an image on the left, so we could use clear left. And that'll bring all this text 
down below it. Let's give it a shot. So in here, I have an image tag. And as earlier we said in the CSS, we said the image is float left. So why don't we create um, something for the paragraph to clear it left? So we'll do, uh, <laughs> just putting, so let's do paragraph dot, uh, let's say clear left. We'll do a class of clear left for paragraphs. And let's just say clear left. I'll put that into my clipboard, come back here, and we'll tell it class equals clear left. So the image is floating left, the paragraph is clearing left, which means anything that's floating, it will be dropped below it. Okay, let's give it a shot. Refresh, and there you go. All the text that was up here to the right of the image is now dropped below the image. That's clear. If you do clear right, um, it will do the opposite, but if you do clear both, then it'll just drop the text below any floating elements above it, or it'll drop the text so it's below any floating elements because obviously they wouldn't have been above it if you didn't have clear. The next big or important topic that I think we should cover is position. So if you have elements on your page and you need them to stay in a certain place, or if you need them to be in a certain amount of space apart from something else but you don't know exactly where that other thing is going to be which really comes into play often with dynamic pages but also sometimes with static pages you can use position now there are a few different types of position there's static position which is the typical position when you don't specify what it is and in which case you can't use the keywords top bottom left right or there is absolute position when you want to always put something you know, a certain distance uh, from something else. Um, and then there is relative position, which is kind of just what it sounds like relative to something else. And then there is fixed position. And you'll often see that where it doesn't matter if you're scrolling up or down, things always kind of are put where you tell them to go, such as with a header or a footer in a document. So let's try them out and see what they look like. There's also sticky position. Um, but I don't really use that, and I've been told it doesn't work in some browsers, so you might want to skip that for now. Uh, you could look it up if you're interested. Okay, let's begin. So I went ahead and modified the image CSS for all images to say that it's going to be 25% in size, so that just makes it a little easier to see it moving around for this example. And I added the right and top properties um, so that I could say it's going to move 300 pixels from the right is going to be the right edge of the image, and 500 pixels from the top of the screen is going to be the top of the image. However, since I did not set the position tag here, it's going to be static, and it's not really going to do anything. So let's add position. Inherit just means what's already there. It's kind of, you're probably never going to use inherit. So why don't we say position uh, relative, relative to the other elements on the page. And there you could see it's all that distance from the top and it's all this distance from the right. There's the right edge, there's the top edge of the image. Okay, so let's modify that. That was relative to the other text on the screen. So now if we change it to absolute, this is interesting. It's basically saying absolute's basically saying I don't care about anything else. I don't care what's already there. And that's kind of the key, key part. I don't care what is already there, right? Well, there wasn't something already there, otherwise it would be over top of it. So let's make that a bit more interesting. Let's only bring it down 200 from the top. Ah, so you can see it's over top of something else. So I know earlier we talked about opacity. You could now change the opacity of this image to be something like 30%, and you'll see those letters underneath it through the image might come in handy, right? When you're designing certain types of web pages. All right. So we talked about fixed. We talked about, uh, I'm sorry. We talked about uh, static, absolute, and relative. Let's talk about fixed now. And let's say, let's leave it the way it is. And refresh. Uh, we need enough text to scroll to make that interesting. So let's go back to our HTML. 
and let's copy the second paragraph and put it in here a couple of times. Refresh. All right. So now you can see I could scroll and it's fixed there. You're probably thinking, hey, wouldn't Absolute also do that? But no, it wouldn't. I'll show you that. Let's go back to Absolute. And refresh. As you can see, when I scroll with Absolute, it goes with the page. Because it's absolutely always that number of pixels from the top. Whereas Fixed is like, it's that number of pixels from the current scroll location. That is the difference there. The next thing to talk about when I'm getting toward the end of the video here um, is we let's talk about trying to fit things inside of a box and how to make a scroll bar show up. So let's say you got your data vids one class for divs and let's give it a size. Let's say it's going to be uh, width and it's going to be 200 pixels and it's going to have a height of um, 100 pixels. It's not very big. Data vids one class. Let's see what's using that. Let's put her on that larger one that we did. The second paragraph. And let's refresh it. And let's go take a look at what that looks like. Uh, it looks like a big jumble, doesn't it? And that's because by default, even though it's in that square, it's trying to write over top of it. It's trying to show everything, regardless of the fact it doesn't fit. But you've only allocated that much of the page for your div, which is 100, which is like, you know, just a couple of lines. It's not very big. So let's go ahead now and tell it how we want that to behave. Let's go back to our CSS and let's tell it overflow. So overflow X means horizontal overflow. We want to deal with overflow X and overflow Y. Your choices is auto, hidden, scroll. So um, hidden, it just means that anything that doesn't fit in that box is not going to be shown at all. Scroll is going to actually put a scroll bar. And visible is just going to kind of do what it just did and kind of throw it over top. Inherit is just going to do what it would do if you had no CSS for it. So let's go ahead and do visible. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's go ahead and do scroll because that's going to be the most interesting. And let's give it a scroll bar for vertical as well as horizontal. And I think we have a couple of divs out there using this class, so it should be kind of interesting. All right. There you go. There's our one where we pasted the three paragraphs earlier. And there's the div above it. And it's not enough to go horizontal. But that is the other thing too, is if, if you are telling it that it can overflow both X and Y, you're leaving it up to the browser to decide. You might want to just tell it, you know, you're going to overflow X or you're going to overflow Y. Doing it both doesn't always make the most sense. Um, depends how you want to design your page. Well, there are a ton more of CSS that I could show you, but I think that I have just now showed you everything that you need to, to know to use CSS to build a page. So if you're interested in more advanced topics, come back, let me know, shoot me a comment, message, and I will build you another video on more advanced CSS topics. And uh, if you do so, please maybe throw out a couple of ideas that you have on specific things that you'd like to see. I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a wonderful day.